few years ago, I gave a talk in Japan. It was translated in real time. And I spoke very fast, like I always do. And the audience loved it. Everyone was laughing and enjoying it. And at the end of the uh, afternoon, the translator came to me and said, you know, you spoke so fast, I couldn't catch up. So I just told them the following thing. The speaker just told a joke, please laugh. And everyone just did it. <laughs> so I hope that this one wasn't translated by the guy before and you actually understand me. I'll do my best to speak fast and still communicate a really complex idea. And the complex idea is that the world is complex. And as the world gets more and more complex, it is harder and harder for our brain to make decisions correctly and to align them with what we want. And I want to tell you a story that will help me communicate that. So 15 years ago, I used to be a hacker. My job was to break into banks and the government and try to steal money and show them how people can do that. And at some point, I was hired by a telephone company to try to break into their system and try to steal records and change them. I spent two weeks trying to do that, and me and my team failed. We couldn't get in. And then one afternoon, around 5 p.m. on a Friday, the woman at the center of this telephone company was sitting there, and she got a call from a technician. And the technician says, I'm in the field far, far away. There's a cell tower that's not working, and I'm supposed to fix it. I'm trying to log in, and I don't remember the password. Can you give me the password? Now she says, mm, I don't know, I'm not supposed to give anyone the password over the phone, but she looks on the map and she sees that indeed there is a cell tower that's broken where the guy says he is, and she sees that the call comes from the right place, so she's kind of inclined because if she doesn't and the guy cannot get in, there will not be cell service for the next 24 hours, maybe, maybe the entire weekend. What is she going to do? She needs to leave soon. Will she give the password? What would you do? Would you cave or would you stick to the rules? I see someone nodding their head. Let's make it more complex. The guy says, you know, I can prove to you that I am who I say I am. I can give you last week's password, which I remember. And he gives her the correct password from the week before. He says even more. He says, I remember this week's password starts with AQV. I just don't remember the last letter. And it's correct. The password from the last week is the password that he says it is. The password from this week starts with AQV. But still, does she trust a person she doesn't know and give him the password for the entire system? She decides not to. And she goes home, very scared. Coming back Monday morning, she gets a call from the chief security officer of the company. He says, congratulations. Hackers were trying to get in. They faked a broken tower. They somehow knew the password the last week before, but you stood up to him. We're going to send a newsletter to the entire company highlighting how you did what you did. I want to ask you a few questions about yourself. How many years you've been with the company? What's your name? What's your profession exactly? What was your education? And as she answers those questions, the company gets hacked and all the files are being stolen. And that is because the person who called her on the Friday to ask her for the password was me, trying to convince her to give her the password. But also the person who called her Monday morning was me, <laughs> pretending to be the chief security officer. And when I asked her questions about her mother's maiden name, her uh, favorite hobbies, she gave me all the information I needed to actually access the system through her account. Now, see, hackers know a lot of things about the human psychology that allow us to exploit vulnerabilities like that. Sun Tzu, in his book, The Out of World, talks about the fact that people tend to really keep their guards up when the first attack comes, but if they manage to block it, they lower their guards, and then the second one is the one that's going to get you, which is what happened there. But also, he speaks about one important thing that I want to talk about today, which is that we tend to be really, really skeptical, questioning, doubtful, critical of people coming from the outside, but we're very trusting of the inside. And the inside is what's actually being hacked right now and what people can exploit to get to us. We call it the M&M, like a really, really strong shell that keeps things from the outside, but once you get in, it's all chocolate. We trust our brain blindly. And more and more, hackers like myself are showing that we can actually get into your mind and change some things there. And when we do that, you will never suspect it. Years of evolution have taught us to be skeptical of the outside world, but never to doubt our own mind. If you start doubting your own thoughts, it would be really, really difficult to live a normal life. My students made this t-shirt that I think helps us <laughs> understand how difficult it is. It says, don't believe everything you think. And that is maybe the take-home message for my talk today. 
which is what needs to be changed is that we need to start doubting our own minds. Let's do a thought experiment in this room. You're sitting with me right now, you're in this room, tomorrow you meet your friend, and your friend says, you know, it was lovely that yesterday we were together in the library. You say, no, 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 yesterday I was listening to this speaker talking about the brain, I remember. The guy says, no, you were with me in the library. Here is a picture of the two of us in the library. And he shows you a picture of the two of you. How likely are you to change your mind to say, you know what, maybe I wasn't listening to a talk in the morning, I was actually in the library. The reality is that it's very, very hard for you to believe anything if your mind contradicts that. You will think that you're right, regardless of tons of evidence that comes to the contrary, because we rarely mistrust our own brain. Okay, so to understand how difficult it is, I want to talk to you about hacking and explain to you how easy it is for people to actually come between and change things. And for this, I want to tell you a story that hackers use a lot. It's the story of a guy called Bob and his friend uh, Alice, A and B. Bob wants to send a chest full of gold to Alice, but uh, unfortunately, somewhere between the two of them, there's a really bad guy, the villain, who would, if he sees the chest passing by, open it and steal all the gold. You know what, we're, we're in Portugal, let's call them uh, Bono and Alejandra, is that a name? Bruno and Alejandra. So Bruno wants to send a chest to Alejandra. He just doesn't want the villain to steal the money. The problem is he needs to somehow find a way to send it to her so she can open it without meeting him. Well, this was a problem in security for a while, but the way to do it is what's called public key security. What Bruno is going to do is he's going to take the chest, put the gold in, and lock it with a lock that only he has the key for. And then he would send it to Alejandra on the other side she would get it, but she can't open it because she doesn't have the key. Only Bruno has the key. What she would do is she would take another lock, her lock, and put a second lock. And then she would send the chest back to Bruno. Bruno now has a chest with two locks. One is his, one is someone else's. He takes his key, unlocks the lock that he put there, sends it back a second time, and now when it gets to Alejandra, she can open it, and the chest passed through the room, always locked. The villain couldn't open it, and Bruno and Alejandra didn't have to meet. This is at the heart of every communication you do with your banks, with Amazon, with any security system. You don't really have to go to Amazon and agree on what's the password. You just send them something, they send you something back, you encrypt the encryption, and together you create a way by which you can communicate with many, many services out there without anyone needing to meet each other and without anyone being able to read your communication. But there is a problem with this. And the problem is called man-in-the-middle attack. Because the guy in the center, the villain, can actually hack this idea. What he can do is use the fact that both sides have a protocol that they believe that works the same way. So Bruno thinks the following. He thinks, I take a chest, I put the gold in, I lock the chest with my lock, send it away, and a few minutes later I expect to get a chest back with two locks. I think it comes from Alejandra, but maybe the villain sees the chest, puts another lock, and sends it back. If Bruno trusts the protocol, he wouldn't know that it didn't come from the right place. He would just take out his lock, send it back, and the villain took it. The villain can do the same thing with Alejandra. He can put a chest with a lock, send it to her. She trusts the protocol. She gets a chest with a lock, she puts another one, sends it back, and a few seconds later, she gets only her lock, opens it, and she thinks it came from Bruno. This attack, man in the middle, comes every time we have a system that's very complex, that has many, many structures that talk to each other and don't know what the other person is doing. And unfortunately, this is also how our brain works. Our brain has many, many sites, and each site has its own function, and it just knows that it expects some input and outputs to come and go, but it doesn't really know what other systems are doing. For example, if I ask you right now how much is a 2 plus 5, let's go over all the steps that happen in your mind for you to get the answer. First, you heard my sound that turned molecular vibrations in the air into a uh, concept in your auditory cortex, which you then move to the part of the brain that does language processing, and there you saw the sentence 2 plus 5, then you had to break it into perceptual entities, so you sent it to a different system that says, okay, there's something called 2, something called 5, something called pass, each of them is its own thing. We need to do equation solving, so let's send it to the math area that's going to do the crunching and come up with the number 7. Send it back, another entity is now set there, the number seven, which is being sent to the language area, where you make it into a word seven, and then maybe you send it to the area of the brain that controls the mouth and tells the mouth how to move to say it. 
That's just a simplification of all the systems involved in your brain when you do the solution to the question, how much is 2 plus 5? Now, the thing is, the system in the center doesn't know how to do math. It just sends those entities and waits for a number. So if someone sat in the middle and just saw the communication and sent a different answer, you would never know. If instead of the number 7 coming up from the one earlier, you would just get the number 9, you would think this is the answer. You would never doubt your own mind. And in fact, now, in the world, we have more and more people that have a device, an implant in their brain that can sit in between and do things for them. In the US, there's about 40,000 people right now that have a chip inside their brain for clinical purposes, usually for clinical depression or for Parkinson's disease. And this is supposed to do only one thing, but the reality is that as soon as you put something digital in your brain, hackers can come in and start changing things. So not only do you have the problem of having to be skeptical of the outside world, now you have to ask yourself, do I trust my own mind? And as time goes by, more and more people from Silicon Valley mainly come to me as a scientist and say, we want to put a device inside our brain. And my prediction is that at some point it's going to happen. People are going to want more brain power. They're going to want to be able to access Wikipedia from their mind to solve much more complex uh, problems than how much is 2 plus 5 in their mind, to maybe speak more languages intuitively, to have better memory, to do high-frequency trading. As soon as we see the benefit for that, people are going to want more and more of that. And as you have a chip inside your brain, the sky is the limit to what hackers can do to get in and change stuff. So, what are we going to do about that? Well, the good news is that hackers also gave us some solutions. Hackers know something that I think would be important for you to know, which is that there is a way to fight hacking into a system, and that is to doubt the integrity of the security. You can put all the firewalls, all the antiviruses, everything to secure things from the outside, but in the end, what hackers would tell you is that the best way to defend something is to say, hmm, Let's imagine for a second that someone is already in my system, that someone is already hacked into my system. What would I do then? Imagine that someone is already hacked into your emails. What would you do? Maybe you will change your password right away. Maybe when you start looking at your emails, you will say, hmm, is that something that really could come from who it said it is? Or maybe I should doubt it and I call and say, hey, did you send me this thing? You know, a few days ago was uh, April 1st, which is also known as April Fool. And I was traveling with two of my friends, and I tried to prank them on April Fool. I told them something, and as soon as I started my prank, the first guy said, wait, it sounds very suspicious, and today is April 1st. I'm going to listen to you with some criticism. And in many ways, this is what we should do. We should always say, do I actually believe my own thoughts? Because in a world where someone can hack into our brain, we would have a hard time even knowing if what we think we are is true. And the entire premise of the world right now relies on you trusting yourself. We have people going to the voting ballot, and in the end they close the curtain and they say, now it's only me, now I can reach into my own gut and know what I want. And I'm going to look and dive deep into my personality and decide if I vote Democrats or Republican. And I know, and we have sentences like, the voter always knows, or the customer is always right, or beauty is in the eye of the beholder or seeing is believing, and all of them assume one thing, which is when it goes into your mind, you can trust it. So solutions. First, doubt. Always true, didn't change now. Another one, surround yourself with people that can verify your reality. Ask questions. Do you think that's something I would say? More so, put yourself next to people that have opposite opinions. This is really helpful, and in fact, a really good game to play is to say, you know, I always was a Democrat all my life. I'm about to vote Democrats. I want to stop for a second and ask the question, what would need to happen for me to convince myself to vote the opposite, the Republicans? The same way I told you in the beginning to ask yourself, what needs to happen for you to convince yourself that you are not here with me? If you live in a world where you say, everyone can hack into everything and I can't trust my own mind, a good idea is to play a game where every now and then you say, let's doubt everything in my mind and try to create a new world. And the reality is that the world around us is complex and it's full of those moments where you find commercials for 
a watermelon that says it's seedless, but it has seed next to it. A company named two men in a truck with uh, three men in a truck. Something called a chock full of nuts that on the cover says no nuts. A store that says everything in dollar next to the two dollar sign. Or the worst for every kid. Something that looks like a cake from the outside but actually is broccoli. There's going to be a lot of good things that come with a world that allows us to get more access to the outside. Get communication from the internet, get languages translated automatically. But with it comes the risk that the world around us is going to have a lot of programs running around. And hackers know this one sentence with which I want to end. Your brain is programmable. And if you don't program it yourself, someone else will. Thank you so much. <laughs>